Well, hello everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Who is whoever is tuning in? I am Chirag Thakkar, and you are watching Roli Pulse, a digital initiative by Roli Books. We are going live right now in association with Scroll dot in, Crossword Books, and Shopstop, and you are watching this live right now on Roli Books' Facebook and Twitter pages, as well as the Facebook pages of Scroll dot in, Crossword Books, and Shopstop. So wherever you are tuning in from, thank you. In case you miss seeing this live. Right now, we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel, and if you lose the connection midway, uh, you can also find the same video on YouTube. Uh, for over four weeks now, since the lockdown began in India, in the absence of books at bookstores, we and Roli Books have been bringing you these engaging live sessions, recorded chats with writers, artists, public intellectuals, sports persons, industry leaders, historians, journalists, among others. Via our digital platform, Roli Pulse, and I want to thank each of you uh, who have been tuning in, sharing your comments, asking questions, sharing this video with others. Just like the previous sessions, you can share your responses, ask our panelists questions. If you're watching this on Facebook or Twitter, and if you are watching this uh, particularly on Facebook and Twitter, you can share this on your timeline and start a watch party. Uh, we will also be posting this later on our YouTube channel as well as our Instagram. Uh, TV, which is the IGTV. Today's conversation is perhaps uh, perhaps one of the most pressing, relevant, and a much needed one. Uh, a few weeks and months, depending on where you are and which part of the world you are watching this from, into this lockdown, the world as we know it is no longer the same. Uh, while we are all in this global simultaneous trauma, a pandemic, and this kind of lockdown together, we're also experiencing this at our own pace. Uh, as individuals, communities, neighborhoods, states, and nations. And this evening, we bring to you a varied set of voices to talk about this specific global health emergency and what lessons we can draw from our present and the past for the future that we are all going to be part of. Joining us in this very uh, pressing and relevant conversation are Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, Lakshmi Subramaniam, Brahman and Lakshmi Narayan in conversation with Maya Mitrandani. Kiran, as many of you know, is executive chairperson at Biocon Limited, a successful technocrat of global standing. She heads India's leading biotechnology enterprise, Biocon. Kiran is highly respected in the corporate world and has been voted by Nature Biotechnology as the most influential person in bio business outside of Europe and the USA. We have with us Raman and Lakshmi Narayan, who's the founder and director of Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy in Washington, DC. He is also a senior research scholar at Princeton University and affiliate professor at the University of Washington. Since 1995, Ramanan has worked to improve the understanding of antibiotic resistance as a problem of managing a shared global resource. We have with us Lakshmi Subramaniam, who is an Indian historian with a long and distinguished teaching and research career. Post her tenure as professor of history at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, uh, Calcutta, she's been researching with the Godrej Archives in Bombay. Currently, she's professor at the Humanities and Social Sciences Department in Bits Bilani, Goa, and is also associate member at the Institute of Advanced Studies in France. And we have Lakshmi, Ramanan, and uh, Kiran in conversation with Maya Mitchell who is an award winning Indian journalist with interest in Indian foreign policy, South Asia, and identity conflicts. She moved to research and teaching after over two decades at NDTV India. Maya teaches media studies at Ashoka University and is also senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. So welcome to Roli Pulse, Kiran, Lakshmi, Ramanan, and Maya. I do hope you enjoy this chat and I'll just hand over to Maya to get us started. Well, thanks a lot, Chirag, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And it's great to be on a panel uh, which is uh, so illustrious and has so much to contribute to this conversation and trying to understand the times we're in. Uh, but I'd like to start with uh, Raman and Lakshmi Narayanan, of course, because you know a lot of uh, a lot of what you uh, put out in terms of numbers and data um, uh, in the early early weeks. Been, you know, preceding the lockdown when India was first beginning to sort of recognize the the concerns around the coronavirus, um, you you talked about how you know over 250 million Indians would be infected, how there would be a lot of deaths in India. Uh, are you pleasantly surprised with uh, the fact that those numbers haven't met 
uh, your predictions? Uh, thanks, Maya. And uh, this is something that uh, you know I always have, you know like to have an opportunity to explain. Uh, so where do we start? Mid January, we had uh, the Wuhan epidemic really getting out of control. India had already stopped flights to China. They brought some people back by the end of January on those special flights. There were three patients who were infected. They fortunately arrived in Kerala, which has a good health system. They were quarantined. No further problem from there. But into you know most of February, we didn't do a whole lot because we weren't really sure about you know how badly it was going to affect India. But by the mid February, we already begin, began to see what was going to happen in Italy and, and Spain after that. Uh, but there still wasn't a huge amount of action beyond uh, that initial screening, which was mostly focused on passengers coming in from the east side. And what we knew by then was that uh, most patients with COVID are asymptomatic. So just screening passengers for fever at the border was not going to be a very effective measure to prevent people from coming in. And certainly by early March, we had a bunch of cases, mostly from people who brought it in from Italy, Italian tourists, but also Indians are coming back from, uh, from Europe. And uh, those were the first cases that truly seeded the epidemic. Now, what was concerning to me starting from early March, when this was, you know, this was clearly getting out of control, was a narrative that was building up, which was that somehow Indians are immune to the virus. We're not really gonna get it because we're very different. We have, uh, you know, we have uh, better exposure to viruses, or you know, we say namaste, or whatever else it is. And that was a very worrying narrative because this particular uh, example, which is of a new virus which attacks a completely naive population, is one that you see only in textbooks. You know, I really see the students at Princeton, and and this would be the kind of project that my my undergraduates would do as a modeling exercise. You never get to see this in the real world. Hmm. And actually, when you see this happening and with a reproductive number like you know, 2.7, which means every patient infected creates 2.7 additional infecteds, uh, you get to large numbers extremely fast, extremely fast. Now, India had the advantage of first that our first cases probably came in much later than they did into Europe or into the US. Now, we find out that the US probably had early cases back in January itself because they have a lot of back and forth traffic with China. So the predictions that we made in early March, which were through to July, and remember we're not in July yet, uh, were over 300 million cases. And remember, yeah. over 300 million infections, infections mm. of which the vast majority would be mild or asymptomatic. That's what most people forget. We always said they're gonna be mild or asymptomatic, but because of India's population, even if a very small proportion of those ended up being severe, the fact that we only have 100,000 ICU beds in the country means that even if you had 600,000 or a million or 1.5 million severe infections, things could turn really bad because we don't have the capacity. And uh, certainly by that time, it was hard to get people to socially distance. Uh, and uh, you, know, you saw these religious gatherings that were going on with hundreds of thousands of people. No one was really paying attention to the request to not have these sorts of gatherings. Hmm. And that was the scenario in which a lockdown was advised and came into place March 24th. A lockdown is an extreme measure, uh, but it seemed that none of the intermediate measures were really working in India. So if we are not seeing cases now, it's a function of two things. We got cases much later. So we ran about four or five weeks behind Europe with the epidemic. Uh, and the second is, of course, the lockdown, which has a tremendous impact on flattening the curve. Now, let's be clear, there's a lot we still don't know about the virus. So we're learning these things every day. Literally, it's like an education every day based on the research that's coming in. So by no means can we be definitive. Uh, I don't doubt that the disease will spread widely. What we don't know is the numbers that will be severe cases and the numbers that will be asymptomatic as a proportion of that total number of infections. So if I can just ask a quick follow-up to that before I move on to the other panelists. I mean, I, I take your point that, you know, your predictions are till July and you're talking about uh, a number of people infected. You're not talking about the severity of that uh, that infection. Uh, I, and you were basically, your concerns were about, about how, what proportion of the population would be asymptomatic or mild versus also, my, sorry to interrupt and also yeah. this was this was if you did nothing at all so this was right. a with correct. No lockdown whatsoever. correct i understand that but i'm just so i would like to ask you that in 
given the proportion of cases that we have seen, the ones that have been tested, I mean, we can go into the arguments and Kiran will talk to that, talk towards that in a bit about the lack of testing or how much testing has been done. But out of the proportion tested, uh, you, the severity, the fatality is, is not at the rates we've seen uh, in Western countries. We've seen a, a clear sort of, uh, um, um, I don't know if it's, I don't want to speculate. I'm not a health person, uh, a public health person. I'm not a medical person. But is it that we've seen a milder strain of the virus? Is it that people in uh, the subcontinent, I mean, we're looking at numbers across Pakistan, Bangladesh, India. Uh, so, uh, 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 is there some kind of herd immunity that the public already has? Um, is, I mean, what what do you think are the reasons why we've just not seen the kind of um, the deaths, the infection rates, the fatality, mortality rates that we've seen in Italy or in the United States? I mean, just take what's happening in the US, for example, where the healthcare systems are better equipped to deal with, uh, with a pandemic, with an epidemic than we are. Right. So I'll give you a very brief response here because uh, I think the others should weigh in. I think fundamentally the answer is just the two that I gave you, which is uh, what the lockdown does is pushes out a curve. It doesn't necessarily flatten the curve. It just gives us time. And that was the idea behind the lockdown to get us through to July so that we get all those beds ready. The reason I think, and this is again based on only what we know so far, that we have not seen the rates of infection that you see in the West is simply because we are running about four or five weeks behind those countries in terms of the outbreak. And if you take Mexico, for instance, which has one tenth of our population, similar temperature to India, uh, you know, is already also in the same season, for instance, Mexico, one tenth of population has over a thousand deaths and more infections. So uh, there is also no evidence that we have a milder strain. If there is, we don't have evidence of it. Let's, let me just put it that way. So we might just be lucky in terms of running a few weeks behind in the epidemic. And remember, four or five weeks for an epidemic like this is a lot. I mean, every two weeks, you're going to have you know, exponential increases. So we're lucky with respect to the delayed entry, number one. Pakistan got it from Iran. Pakistan didn't get it directly from China. We got it from Europe. The second is, of course, that all these countries, whether Bangladesh, Pakistan, Pakistan also, they resisted a lockdown initially, but you know, eventually, very quickly, they also put a lockdown in place. And in India, we were lucky to get a lockdown very early. Whereas in uh, the US, there was no real lockdown that happened. And in Europe, in Europe, they started imposing the shelter at home only after the epidemic peak was really climbing quite a bit. Mm, which is quite right. a time to do it. So I think we were, we've both been uh, lucky and we've done some things early, but that doesn't mean that we've seen the end of this. Okay, let me bring the others into this as well. And uh, Lakshmi, I'd like to actually come to you next because, uh, you know, a lot of what we're talking about today uh, has to do with how India has dealt with health crises in the past as well. What the state of our preparedness has been, what our public and community responses have been, uh, and also in terms of, you know, globally, how have uh, epidemics or pandemics as COVID is, um, really changed the way uh, you know the, the world sort of understands its context and what's going on so just weigh in on that because you know as a historian how would you compare this to i mean what would you compare it to what what's a case that you could compare okay. it to? Uh, yeah um uh, thanks, uh, Maya, for that question, and hello to all. Uh, I'm going to try and answer this question in two ways. I think, um, as a historian or a student of history, definitely, I think the challenges of writing in the present are always difficult, because when you write history, you always have the advantage of retrospective insight, and therefore you can sort of reflect on what happened and then think, and offer sociological explanations to how the epidemic came, how it was received, how governments responded, whether we had adequate healthcare systems and so on. So this pandemic as a historian is sort of bewildering because in many ways it just tells you about the challenges of writing something which you are witnessing in the present. Hmm. On the other hand, I'm not very keen on drawing immediate parallels from what happened in the past because I do think that while we have lessons from history, I don't think it gives you the exact 
formula to deal with you know the situation right. that we're in now right. so i would be hesitant to compare say covid 19 with the influenza that you know this sort of uh, wrongly termed the spanish flu it wasn't the spanish flu but shall we say the influence of 1918 and which in fact uh, took away many more people in india than covid has now in the yeah. rest of the world so i think an easy comparison of epidemics is sort of a little difficult and can be very disheartening but to answer your question more practically i think um, you know history definitely tells me one lesson which is there is almost a timeless fear hmm. that we associate with epidemics and i'm not always sure that that fear is from the real experience of human suffering which undoubtedly you had with the plague in bombay or mm. the pandemic uh, mm. in 1918 has to do with certain kinds of communication so i think a lot of what i feel now is drawn this fear the stigma that you know we are always sort of encountering mm. in relation to the covid-19 so there is this sort of mad hysterical um, dumbing down of what say ramanan says so you have a lot of people saying oh no he has no idea these numbers can never happen to us i think this kind of fear and this kind of looking away from scientific rational model making or epidemiological insights i think is very dangerous so i think here we don't seem to have learned our lessons from history we seem to be faltering in pretty much the same way we are still uh, you know we still think it's important to say that we have done not so badly the west has done badly rather than thinking about what does good communication entail hmm. what does the state have to do what is state responsibility how can we be more socially empathetic to thinking about labor and livelihood and indeed the fear of pandemic so i think i would prefer to stay with the present try to come to terms with what one encounters in the present and then draw some hope from the lessons we may have learned or may have chosen to forget so that would be my immediate response um can i compare this to the 1919 influenza yes and no uh, you know i think uh, man has to man has cohabited with the flu for a long time uh, we may forget those modes of cohabitation we of course have a full blown crisis in our hands and i think we have to learn from certain lessons and be very alert to the way in which government civil society and us as the general public uh, you know treat this disease and more importantly treat the disease in our social body not just to treat the disease in our individual body so i am much more concerned with the social ramifications of this problem rather than simply say whether we are prepared or not prepared maybe we are maybe you are not i think we have to wait and see right okay you know you you raised that very important uh, point about fear and that's where i want to bring you in kiran mazumdar show because you know fear uh, and stigma around uh, the disease fear of you know whether i'll get it whether i'll get it and i'll be asymptomatic so i won't know will i pass it on to somebody else oh my god what will my housing society say if i fall sick i mean we're seeing all kinds of manifestations of this this fear but uh, at the end of the day you know people are also looking towards science to deliver us from that fear and you deliver us in terms of you know treatment protocols in yes. terms of better testing uh, we've had us we've had reports about how all these test kits have have actually not worked they've been faulty uh, in the last last few weeks that they, that that have been going on and and of course this race to a vaccine it's a global race to a vaccine right now so just to ask you uh, you know for for firms like yours for enter, for entrepreneurs like you for uh, technocrats for people in the healthcare space i mean this is probably the biggest challenge you're facing of your career yeah i mean i think we are all living through very surreal times i mean nobody hmm. expected this pandemic this microscopic monster to come and just disrupt our lives hmm 
But, uh, you know, let me just a couple of things. You mentioned about the fear psychosis. You mentioned something about the stigma. Hmm. I agree with both my panelists that, look, look, I think you need very clear messaging to basically take this paranoia out of people. For instance, when I look at some of the data today, hmm. I feel that we are in a more comfortable position than we were maybe in March. You know, Ramanan talked about some of the data points uh, which really got him to make these kind of uh, predictions and modeling. But, you know, let's not forget that um, we did impose that lockdown. And by doing that, and by the way, I must also tell uh, Ramanan that contrary to your comment that, you know, we were just uh, taking temperatures of, uh, you know, the passengers coming into India, we did mm. much more than that. We actually quarantined all foreign travelers. I can tell you that anyone coming off a foreign flight was quarantined at home. Mm -hmm. And you will not believe it, Ramanan. They were checking on you. I mean, it was amazing for me in Bangalore. This is what happened. I mean, there were people, health officers from the Department of Health calling up to make sure you were at home and that you were quarantined. This was amazing. I've never seen this happening. Okay. And... Uh, you know, so there were a lot of very stringent measures taken, even at the time of quarantine. Of course, later on, the lockdown came. Now, if you look at the day, see, first and foremost, five and a half weeks is a long lockdown in which to actually slow down the spread, to deal with preparedness. And that's what we've all been working at. I, I'm in several task forces, and I'm trying to see what should we have as a state of preparedness. And when I start looking at certain data, you asked about testing and, mm. and positive cases. There is something called TPR or the test positive rates. Okay, In India, 1 in 23 people are testing positive. Of course, you can debate on whether we are testing enough or not. Yeah, But that's the rate right now. Now, that is about 4.4%. ,4 if you compare that to New York or US, it is almost 20% which means 20 out of 100 people tested are testing positive. You look at, um, you know, um, Europe, it's around 18%. You look at even Japan, it's almost 9%. So we are actually doing quite well in terms of TPRs. Now you look at the slowing down of the spread. It used to double every three days. Now we are doubling every 10 days. So, okay, you may start looking at these numbers and saying, okay, so what does all this mean? I am simply saying that, look, we've done certain things very well. We have actually, in many parts of the country, definitely Kerala and Karnataka and a few other, many states, we have started zoning and containment. Yeah. So every time you see a spike in the number of cases, we are cordoning off and sealing off that particular zone. Okay, or that particular suburb or whatever it is. Even a small housing colony is being zoned off. And you're sealing it off. Now you saw that in, in Bombay, for instance, they had a big outbreak in two uh, areas. One was Dharavi and one was Vadli, uh, Koli Wada. And Koli Wada was actually sealed off and they haven't seen any more rise in cases. So that was very well done. But Dharavi is seeing a big spike because it's a much larger slum. Now, what I'm saying is I'm not so concerned about the number of positive cases because positive cases like Ramanan says will be much more. Mm. I think infection will be much larger than what is being reported today. And we haven't even tested half the asymptomatic carriers of this COVID-19. So I, I'm not going to be surprised if you see a huge surge of positive cases. My major concern has been what is the mortality rate? What is the level of seriousness of, or severity of the disease? That is more important for me than just the positive cases because if we have a treatment, when we get a vaccine, you know, we'll feel mom, far more confident. Okay. Mm. And if our positive cases are mild and asymptomatic and they're recovering very fast, which most of them are, and my theory is that 90% of our population is below the age of 60. If you look at globally, 80% of the deaths have happened over the age of 60. 
So when you look at this kind of numbers, you feel that yes, we are going to get infected, but we have a much younger demographic and that's why we're able to deal with this particular in a much more robust way than Western populations have, which are aging populations. And if you notice in where most of the, uh, you know, the, the deaths have taken place in say Northern Italy, a large 50% of those deaths have taken place in old people's homes because and that's where those population. people yeah. are con you know, living together. So you have to look at all this data and therefore I feel that we are in a better place. And what I'm also hoping is that from the 3rd of May, we should do a calibrated opening up because now you know, we've saved lives, but we need to now save livelihoods. And I think when you look at livelihoods, I really believe that you need to do it in a calibrated way. Of course, you can't open up uh, you know, big public spaces. You're, you're not going to have sporting events. You have to start getting workplaces at least opened up. And in the workplaces, I really believe that opening up has to also go hand in hand with testing. Now, you asked me about testing. Hmm. When we started off on this journey in early March, I can tell you we didn't have enough test kits. And when we got a task force together, we realized that we were not going to get test kits from abroad because all these test kits were going to go to the US and Europe. But that's where the huge impact was. So we very quickly realized we had to produce indigenously made kits. And very quickly, we came up with quite a few companies in India who make these kits from assembled com imported components and they are doing pretty well. Now, we, you know, we started off doing less than 10,000 tests a day. Hmm. A country like India, we need to do at least 100,000 tests. A day. So if I can just interrupt you on the testing, Kiran, I mean, one of the, one of the concerns around the test kit, apart from, you know, whether they are, uh, the cold chain is being maintained and things like that, we've seen some of those reports as well, but is also the, 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 the cost of testing. I mean, it seems prohibitively expensive uh, for, uh, you know, when private labs started to do these tests, I mean, the cost that... Uh, Maya, can I just uh, interject yeah. right here? Yeah. Because yeah. there's yeah. a lot of misinformation being given about the cost of tests. It's, it's, huh. it's unfortunate that media has hijacked this whole debate hmm. the cost issue. Hmm. Please remember hmm. that right now, the, the private sector is hardly testing 10% of all the tests being done in India. Right, right. So 90% of the tests are being given free of cost. Hmm. Government hospitals, government labs. Now, private sector was roped in to actually raise the quantum of testing. testing right. Okay. And the private sector was given a price by the government because this is what they, they were procuring the kits at and this is the cost at which they were doing the tests. So this is how much hmm. it's costing the government. Okay. Right. This is what the government said. This will be your MRP. And the testing uh, diagnostic companies have clearly said that if the cost of the test kits go down, we can also reduce our prices. Okay, because the large part of the, uh, the testing cost is the kit cost. Hmm, hmm. Kit costs reduce, they can reduce the cost. In fact, right now, there's a lot of effort being put into reducing the cost of the kits. Hmm. Now, so let's not get into that debate, okay, because... Right. Testing that is being done is very small. In fact, many people are saying, look, you know, uh, you know, we are willing to give a certain number of tests free. In fact, now governments themselves are procuring large quantum of tests of test kits, private right. sector at a lower cost because obviously economies of scale count. Hmm. If you have to do one test at a time, each test becomes so expensive because you need one person to go in a PPE, which itself costs 1,200 rupees to go and test each person. But right. you actually allow drive-in booths. If you allow testing booths where you can actually collect a lot of samples where one person can collect money. So that's the South Korea model where, you know, you can do a drive-in test or like in yeah, France. There are many models. We've also got it going here. But I'm saying if you do those mass collections of samples, you can bring hmm. down the cost. Hmm. Let's get into other... That's not the main point. Yeah. The main point is you've got those as PCR tests. Those are one type of tests. Hmm. You've got serological tests, which are where, you know, Lakshmi or I mentioned, or you mentioned that some tests were rejected because they were not of good quality, because those are serological tests and they were not sensitive enough for COVID-19 tests. 
And so since the specificity was, uh, was in doubt, they felt mm -hmm. that you may not be testing COVID-19 patients. You might be just testing anyone with flu-like symptoms and saying they're positive or they've recovered and that was not reliable. Hmm. Now we have to actually get serological tests which are very specific to COVID-19, which means the antibody tests that we're talking about must be very specific to COVID-19 and not just to any other influenza or uh, uh, any other kind of uh, uh, coronavirus, let's put it that way, or H1N1 or anything. Now what we are saying is because your body just produces antibodies when you have any kind of Flu. Infection, yeah. Flu, Infection. Right. So you don't want to make that mistake. Anyway, that test is important when you start opening up because if you have a good test, you can actually start um, tracking people who have recovered from that infection. And hmm. that creates your herd mentality, which is very yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's to give you an idea about the testing. We can right. do testing, we can have fever clinics, we can have drive-in testing and all the rest of it and that but, is but Kiran I mean if I can just interrupt you testing is one part of it as you also mentioned but what about in terms of treatment I mean how close are you to is there an antibody treatment yeah, is there a, that convalescent plasma uh, or the vaccine I mean the, there's a race to this vaccine there's patents right. going out there's you know all kinds of things right now going yeah, on so let me time. let me to take it in three buckets so let's yeah. look at what's happening in terms of treatment Huh. Right now, you're right. You know, before the vaccine comes, we need to treat patients and save them, right? So we are looking at any treatment that can rescue people and save lives. So, mm -hmm. so we've tried many, many kind of medications. You know that we tried the hydrochloro. ACQ, that's right. Yeah. yeah it, ACQ, we tried. Then we tried, and now we are trying, trialing remdesivir. We are trying another uh, antiretroviral from Japan. Uh, we are trying many, many things uh, to see if any of them will work, right? As as mm -hmm. Now, the, the jury is out yes. there to see whether it is going to work or not. For instance, uh, we know that uh, Remdesivir has not worked well in China. The trial mm -hmm. data came out yesterday, which was very disappointing. But we've got some other data showing that it does work. And now we are waiting for the main data of a US trial, which is expected end of May may or may not be the magic bullet that everyone wants. So right. Likely to be the magic bullet. Similarly, uh, HCQ also turned out not to be the magic bullet because it has a checkered kind of data points. Now comes the other therapies. So the, the other therapies are plasma uh, therapy, yeah. which is working, by the way. And this is an old therapy. This is not something new. It is well known even during the Spanish flu days they tried plasma therapy and it worked, okay? But the problem with plasma therapy is you can't do it at scale. So, you yeah. know, unless, of course, you can actually do it at scale if you get suddenly a huge number of infected people and who recovered and who didn't know that they recovered, but you suddenly found that these are all convalescent yeah. patients. And if, if really you have these 30, 300 million or 30 million or whatever it is, you can probably take their plasma and uh, recover any patients. But that's right. Being too facetious. Uh, today, of course, you've seen the report that in Delhi, they did some plasma treatment on four patients and they're looking good. Plasma treatment does work, okay? Because you're basically taking convalescent patients' blood, which has neutralizing antibodies against COVID-19. Mm -hmm. You give it to those patients, obviously it will work. The vaccine. Now, when you look at vaccines, I mean, people are also developing antibodies which you can, you know, mimic of the convalescent uh, right, right. in a bioreactor and that is also being developed and that hopefully will also come into the market sooner hmm. than later. But I think everybody's eyes now is on, are on the vaccine. Yeah, so let me just actually on that, I'll just come back to you, Kiran, in a moment. Let me just bring Ramanan in as well on this because, you know, one of the uh, questions, we're getting some questions from our uh, our audiences who are tuning in. Uh, one of them is, you know, uh, there's, there's someone named Naina Ganguly who's asked that, you know, essentially when we talk about this herd immunity, we're also assuming that there were a lot of asymptomatic, as you mentioned, uh, carriers of, of COVID-19. 
how does one know that they are asymptomatic because we, again we come back to the question of testing or the antibody testing you know and it's almost like it's a chicken and egg thing so how in your assessment would we be able to even i mean where do we see this going we we'll, at this rate without the testing without the antibody testing you know without being able to be confident about the fact that just because you feel well doesn't mean you're not a carrier you know where do we go from here right so i'd like to pick up on on the separation that uh, that kiran uh, made one is rt pcr testing the purpose of that and rt pcr is sensitive between about you know 2 and 10 days of infection is primarily to identify people who need treatment and to identify people who need early treatment so rt pcr is looking for rna in your in 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 your you know in your nasopharyngeal swab so basically mm. the part of the they swab and they get it now the antibodies kick in the early antibodies are kicking in about 7 8 days and then the long term ones are kicking in about 15 days so testing will only ever give us the tip of the iceberg always the rt pcr testing which is why even though today uh, we have 20000 cases quote unquote we probably have about 15x of that in terms of actual infections and the only way in which you, which you find that out is not through rt pcr this is not a failing of india this is true anywhere in the world is by doing the serological test and the serological test basically tell us are we carrying the antibodies to the covid or not in other words have we been exposed uh, whether known to us or unknown to us we've been exposed in the past now unfortunately we have not yet carried out a serological survey across india which would give us that information when these surveys have been carried out in france for instance and there was a paper that just came out from the pasteur institute two days ago they mm. found that probably 6% of the french have already been exposed now that's good news because they didn't have a huge number of cases and deaths but already 6% have been exposed so those are the people who already carry the antibodies you know many of them would have been asymptomatic who then are sort of this bunch of people that you can think of it as you know the virus is trying to make its way between people it's jumping from one person to the other but once it runs against a person who's already faced the virus before very likely it won't be able to uh you know get through that person so you can think of these people as roadblocks for the virus now kiran also made the point which you know the very good one which is that uh one thing that protects india in general is our young population 65% of our population is under the age of 35 and most of these folks are going to have asymptomatic infections the only risk category as far as i'm concerned is the kids under the age of 6 months or a year because they have special risk even in the wuhan data but above the age of 1 uh all the way through to probably the age of 40 were probably fine and uh only after that you know the other hypertension diabetes all these taken as risk factors and we only have 6 and a half percent above the age of 65 mm-hmm. so theoretically to get to this herd immunity we need to have 65% of the population that has been exposed whether asymptomatically preferably or symptomatically theoretically it's possible to get to that 65% without touching a single elderly person in india right theoretically it's possible the challenge is how you actually do it when you have joint families and you know parents living with us and all of this stuff and you know my instructions to my mother who's 82 is you are actually homebound till december not till may 3rd but really till december because that's the phase at which i think okay she's safe because you know then there's enough herd immunity that's really built around so the answer to that question is don't worry about whether you're asymptomatic or not i think at this stage it's it's much more a question of the serological surveys which will have to be conducted and will have to be conducted periodically like every month to show where we are in the progression because for disease modeling we can't model much of a disease just based on on what, numbers yeah no just watching the tip we need to have the full iceberg and for that we need the serology Yeah okay I just want to uh, bring uh, Lakshmi in as well before I go back to Kiran because there's a few questions that have come in on the vaccine as well but uh, Lakshmi for you you know one of the questions that were asked was you know what about people because there are reports that come in uh, people who are turned away from the healthcare system even if they're showing symptoms and they're going in so what happens to them and the second question that i have for you really um, it's a kind of a double whammy one is of course on naming conventions of the virus we're seeing a lot of people call it 
the Wuhan virus, just as Ebola has come from the river or Zika has come from, you know, whatever. So we're, we're seeing that naming convention sort of kick in. Uh, of course, we see Trump calling it the Chinese virus as well. So I mean, that's a whole different conversation. That's one. And the second, this idea of the quarantine, this, you know, self-imposed quarantine uh, sure, but the, the notices that went up on on homes and on front doors, there was almost a medieval element to that kind of notice. I mean, was it just me or did others feel it too? Okay, uh, well, very interesting questions. Let me start with the naming conventions. You know, we didn't have naming conventions before WHO insisted that we should have conventions that are sensitive. So, you know, for instance, you could not have had the Spanish flu uh, because it didn't originate in Spain, but we all know it is a Spanish flu because Spain happened to be the place where you had uncensored reporting of the epidemic. So in a sense, you know, epidemics do get certain names quite inadvertently. Um, I think uh, more than naming conventions, which, uh, you know, prejudices doesn't come just because somebody from the top tells you whether it is a Chinese virus or Wuhan virus, I think we just have to dig deeper into our own selves and prejudices come tumbling down. Right. So I think, of course, we have to be sensitive to naming. Uh, of course, we have to be sensitive to naming. But on the other hand, I think just a token and a cosmetic adherence to naming doesn't really solve the prejudice. Like Ramanan said, you know, there is this iceberg of prejudice. And if we just remove something or add something, it's not really going to remove the kind of virus that infects our minds and our prejudices. So that's one. Um, I do think uh, the, the question that you asked about hospitals turning people away and this medieval sense of the quarantine. It's very interesting. You know, it brings me back to the, you know, there's a deja vu about uh, whatever I read now. And when I read something like The Pale Rider of Laura Spinney, I think there is a real fear and there is a real taboo when we deal with contagion. And that contagion might be smallpox that produces a certain kind of response to divinity, or there is this kind of medieval fear of contagion. Uh, I don't think as modern subjects, we're all necessarily so modern that we've overcome that prejudice. So I find it absolutely anathema. I find it obnoxious that we should have these kinds of medieval notices, but I'm not at all surprised that these occur. I think in India, we have this real problem of an epidemic arising with globalization, migrations, interconnectedness, and also with very basic fears that draw from extreme resource crunch. You know, mm. what are you going to go and tell somebody who's working on a livelihood? And you tell him, okay, come, we'll give you some money. And you have all these images that are circulating in all kinds of mobile channels. And he or she does not have the wherewithal, the emotional wherewithal to process this information. So what does he or she do? So, you know, you have this strange balance between, I don't want to call it vestigial medieval, as though there is just one section of people who feel that way. I think we ourselves are so full of prejudice, so full of fear, and unable to grapple with rationality in any sense of the term, that I'm not surprised at all by both acts of omission and commission. So I'm not surprised. I just hope that when this pandemic goes away, whenever it is, December, January, 2021, you know, we, we've learned some social empathy in the, you know, on the way to this, uh, on this way to this terrible disease, because I'm absolutely convinced at one level that the world will never be the same place again. But mm. then the cynical me tells me it'll be business as usual when we actually get over the pandemic. So I hope I'm proved wrong. Right. I think that's a very, uh, very uh, interesting question. And I, I think um, I was having a conversation about about uh, the way people are sort of spending their time, uh, you know, under lockdown. And one of the questions was whether uh, we can find uh, empathy or an empathetic bone in our body, because at the end of the day, the pandemic does not know geography. It does not know race. It does not know religion. It does not know any kind of divisive structure that we like to impose on society uh, and yet we're finding ways nonetheless to find those within the pandemic so that's you know i think it's a question for all of us to kind of introspect on but i'll come back to you 
uh, Kiran, before we uh, end end the the discussion, because we've got a few questions coming in, and we go back to the issue of the vac vaccine. Uh, you know, Lakshmi just made the point. Whenever we come out of this uh, this pandemic, maybe in December 2020 or in early 21, and you know, uh, Rama says he's told his mother she can't step out of the house till December this year. So you know, you know, people really, really want to know and. One question that is asked is whether um, existing treatment or vaccines can be repurposed for COVID. I know you made the point that you have to identify uh, the COVID antibodies separately, but can existing medication be repurposed? Uh, and, you know, we also know that uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, for example, is uh, trying to work on treatments and vaccinations, and he's been involved with Biocon as well on projects. Is there something you have that you're working on for for people to kind of sort of say all right fine we see some light at the end of this tunnel so let me first answer your question about vaccines so I think in india itself we are trying i know that uh, serum institute is trying to do a trial or is about to start a trial on bcg vaccines right because yesterday or day before yesterday robert gallo who's a very well-known hiv virologist actually recommended we should try polio vaccine. Hmm. Uh, the reason being that this is a live attenuated vaccine which should kind of boost your immune system. And he felt that if you actually boost your immune system, you may be in a better position to withstand uh, you know, the COVID-19 if, if it infects you. And the same logic holds good for a BCG vaccine because you know there's been a lot of discussion and debate about whether BCG vaccination has immunized us to uh, against this uh, virus, or there's a lot of uh, ifs. We'll uh, talk about that, yeah. That. But having said that, we know that the BCG vaccine does boost your immunity. And therefore, they're saying, let's do one trial with BCG vaccines to see if we keep on vaccinating people with BCG vaccines, can we hold out till the actual vaccine comes, okay? Uh, Ted and I have actually been uh, discussing about this antibody approach, which I told you, that if you can actually develop uh, neutralizing antibodies against COVID-19 in a bioreactor, obviously that could also be a very good treatment. So treatment is definitely something that will remove a large part of that fear because the moment you know that you know that people can be treated very safely and they're really it's it's a, it's a it's it's really curing people or it's really helping people then ramanan may not be so scared for his mother to you know step out of the house when when it's in the market but um, i would say that uh, until the vaccine comes i think the world will be treading very cautiously they will be very nervous so we are hoping that at least some vaccine will come out sooner than later as far as India is concerned, there are three or four very interesting vaccine programs that are being developed, but they are not even in, uh, in a preclinical state. So unless it gets into human clinical trials, which I don't think it will for the next six months, which would be the earliest, I don't think you can have a, a vaccine from India. There are several vaccines from the US and from Europe and UK, of course, which are being developed. And I hope that one of them actually works. And I hope it's the, you know, I, real, I can see that the, the vaccines being developed in the US, which are mRNA vaccines, are going to be very expensive and very, very difficult to, to uh, deliver because these are going to be delivered in a hospital setting. Now, I don't think those are the kind of vaccines the world can afford. So you really need to get to a basic vaccine which you can give as a jab. So many of these other vaccines that are being developed are being developed as that. So I'm just hoping that one of these will work. Hmm. And in the meantime, let's keep our fingers crossed that some of these therapies that are being looked at also are very effective. Hmm. More than anything else, I'm still very optimistic that given our young demographics and our young workforce, they should be quite safe. And if we can really demonstrate huge herd uh, you know, immunity, through serological testing, I think we'll be in a much safer place. Right. 
Okay, well, that's uh, certainly a positive note to end this discussion on. Thank you all so very much for being a part of this. I know that every conversation that everyone is having uh, on whichever platform and whichever means of communication they have today is around how we get out of this. I, for one, I tend to agree uh, with uh, Lakshmi when she says the world will have changed and yet it will be the same uh, because we, I mean, I foresee a world where we have to carry immunization passports along with our actual passports when we get on a plane or book a ticket um, because who wants to spend two weeks in quarantine when they're trying to go on holiday somewhere right so I mean we will see uh, the future of travel the future of retail the future of hospitality uh, the future of entertainment as we com uh, consume it communities uh, there's a lot of changes you know that that people are concerned about and talking about uh, quite beyond just the impact on livelihoods, but none of that we can really begin to address until uh, the work of the scientists is done for the moment. So thank you all very, very much for being a part of this conversation. Thank you. And also thank remember you. for all the viewers of this, uh, follow Roly Books on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, and Roly Pulse's new digital initiative. I had to say that, I forgot, but I remembered just before we close. So thanks once again. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you.